Lyndon Johnson once uh, was introduced with a glowing tribute such as that, and he said uh, this. He said, thank you very much. I wish my parents would have been here to hear this. My father would have enjoyed it. My mother would have believed it. <laughs> this is a course of six sessions about five presidents, presidents in crisis. The first of these presidents is Woodrow Wilson. The last of them, of course, is Richard Nixon. The first of our sessions today is entitled Wilson Under Siege. So today, we'll not only deal with Wilson's failures at Versailles, but with character traits of this enigmatic but transformational president, traits which surfaced during his presidency of Princeton University, uh, but uh, doomed his initially brilliant presidency of that great Ivy institution. Traits which unfortunately would ultimately prove disastrous on a much more universal stage a decade later in Versailles. In 1919, his errors at Versailles would become the genesis of a number of the presidential crises that would follow decades later, including a number of those we'll consider during this course. The aftermath would highlight a perplexing U.S. foreign policy dichotomy that between idealistic interventionism and realpolitik. Next week, we'll deal with the brutal attacks on everyone's favorite uncommon common man, Harry S. Truman. Although history has been very kind to this most unlikely of successors to FDR, who was, of course, one of the greatest of uh, our 20th century presidents, during Truman's presidency, Truman's popularity ratings were, more often than not, abysmally low. And the loss of China, a phenomenon that arguably had its genesis at Wilson's Versailles, which we'll discuss today, coupled with the Alger Hiss affair, both of which crises happened on Truman's watch, severely impacted this, his reaction to events on the Korean Peninsula. They impacted me as well. We'll discuss that a bit in the second session. Our closest brush with total disaster in the 20th century was undeniably the Cuban Missile Crisis. Most of you lived through it. We're going to take a close look at the motivation, background, and persona of the key players in that crisis. And as you know, more tapes and transcripts in both Washington and Moscow, incidentally, uh, continued to be released. We'll consider JFK's coming of age at the 12th hour and certain seldom highlighted motivations behind the Soviet strategy, which seemed so blatantly demonic. And our surprising primer throughout shall be the entire book called uh, Guns of August by Barbara Tuckman, an elegant history about the genesis of an entirely different conflict, World War I. We'll go on to deal with a presidential fixation. Fixation that had its psychological roots on the poverty-ridden banks of the muddy Perdinalis River in the central Texas hill country. Lyndon Baines Johnson, like his successor Richard Nixon, had the potential to be a truly transformational president. He was responsible during the first years in office for epoch-changing civil rights legislation, uh, which probably could not have been spearheaded by his ill-fated predecessor, John F. Kennedy. But he was tragically overcome by a fixation, one which doomed not only Johnson and his presidency, but the lost generation of the 60s as well. It's a fixation born on the muddy banks of the Pedernales, but ironically, elements of this problem in Southeast Asia uh, that touched off the fatal fixation can also be traced back to the glistening halls of Versailles where we begin today with Woodrow Wilson. Well, to devote our last two sessions to Richard Nixon, why? Why double up on his presidency? Well, Richard Nixon, likewise, had the potential to become one of the greatest presidents uh, in, in American history. Instead, although he accomplished historic breakthroughs in foreign policy, breakthroughs that might well have been denied to other presidents, his defects of character led him to self-destruct and his presidency to spiral inexorably into a vortex became uh, instead a Greek tragedy. 
Despite detente, despite the epic shaping breakthrough to China, despite having fostered numerous progressive, believe it or not, legislative initiatives, Richard Milhouse Nixon, who would be remembered as the first and only American president to resign in office in disgrace. And we'll uh, delve into that dark nexus, the dark nexus of that tragedy, Watergate, uh, and the uh, story of uh, a curious duality, a dichotomy taking place during that tragedy. Well, with that background in mind, we'll then consider how the confluence of the Watergate Saturday Night Massacre and the Yom Kippur War brought this country to the brink of a nuclear holocaust for the second time in a decade. It happened uh, while the crush of Watergate had rendered the president incapable of acting, and it brought to the center stage a Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger. So during these last two sessions, both of them will also focus on the improbable but intriguing relationship between the California Quaker Nixon and his Secretary of State, the German Jewish refugee Henry Kissinger. Together, they were undoubtedly the most influential and accomplished foreign policy team in American history. But their combination was an unlikely one and a complex one, replete with unparalleled initiatives, but also with intrigue, back-channel communications, mutual admiration but backstabbing, jealousness, a healthy dose of 19th century realpolitik, moral indifference, and a Harvard doctoral dissertation. Finally, as some of you may be aware, I firmly believe that all history is comprised of stories. So each of our sessions will reflect this one way or another. They will all feature some stories. Today, we'll start with Woodrow Wilson, Under Siege, and the stories of a student, a busboy, and a prince. Woodrow Wilson, Under Siege. As I have matured intellectually and despaired of the talking heads who appear unendingly on television, my education has become more focused on Snapple bottle caps. Snapple iced tea bottle caps, usually peach, raspberry, always diet. Their pithy little factoids are good conversation pieces for about 10 seconds. And then they pass, except for one which I came across recently. It read, President Warren G. Harding once lost the White House China in a poker game. <laughs> that one got me to thinking, how fickle is the uh, fate that often elects our presidents uh, and how their character traits can affect our lives. Warren G. Harding uh, was a hell fellow well and good met, one of the boys. Now, nobody but Mrs. Warren G. Harding probably missed the set of China, but the country, of course, would ultimately feel the strains of Harding's neglect and his old boy network in the Teapot Dome scandal, uh, which uh, rocked the nation both uh, before and after his untimely death in office. But his predecessor in office, born Thomas Woodrow Wilson, could not have been more different, uh, both in personality and in policy. Wilson was meticulous about his appearance. As the always acerbic Alice Roosevelt Longworth remarked, Harding was not a bad guy. He was just a slob. In the car on the way to Harding's inauguration, Hardy was astounded that Wilson was weeping. A. Scott Berg, in a just released a biography of Wilson, tells us that Wilson was deeply depressed because he was uh, physically unable to mount the inaugural platform and had to be lifted out of the car at a freight entrance. Well, he may also have been depressed because he was passing the baton to his very antithesis. Wilson was an idealist interventionist. Harding was anything but. His inaugural address exhorted the American people to shun military, economic, or political commitments to any authority other than our own. The struggle between Wilsonianism and realpolitik is never ending. It's a conflict in various forms which we will encounter throughout this course. It's now well documented that during his last year in office, 
actually last year at a half an office. Wilson, from October 1919 until the inauguration of Warren G. Harding in March of 1921, was unable uh, to carry out uh, the duties of the office. Wilson's wife, Edith Bowling Galt Wilson, was in control of the White House. She was essentially his alter ego during the last 18 months of his presidency. She was, in fact, for a year and a half, the first woman president of the United States. A tough lady, um, this Edith. Tough enough to shelter Woodrow Wilson from all but his most intimate associates during the lengthy period of his uh, incapacity uh, following a very severe paralyzing stroke. However, she was tough enough also to carry out his immutable policies, his stubborn refusal to cede the presidency to his vice president, uh, Thomas Riley Marshall, whom he regarded as an inferior political hack. And more importantly, his adamant refusal to compromise with Congress by accepting any proposed reservations or uh, amendments to the very flawed treaty that he had um, returned with from Versailles. It was an obstinacy which unfortunately doomed any chance of the United States participating uh, in the League. And uh, it was a commitment which we lacked, which the League didn't have, although Wilson had devoted his entire life, the last years of his life, to the project. Our absence severely undermined and eventually doomed the League as a viable entity. Why? Why the infernal obstinacy which shattered his life's dream? Perhaps our three stories may begin to address the elusive why. Of the stories of a student, a busboy, and a prince, the first is a personal experience at Princeton in 1949. The last two happened at Versailles in 1919. Miles apart, three decades apart, but together, hopefully the student, the busboy, and the prince may begin to offer a clue as to the elusive why. Wilson did not suffer fools gladly. Although he was a brilliant writer and speaker, he was a lonely man, a dreamer with the type of intellect that found it difficult to tolerate ordinary mortals. Supremely self-confident, but his supreme self-confidence was not only his most outstanding virtue, it proved to be his biggest handicap as well, since his habit was to rely on his own domineering personality, power of persuasion uh, to affect policy. The result was a lack of flexibility not only led to much of the bitterness and disappointment at the sad end of his career, had severe consequences on the balance of the 20th century. Regrettably, many of these consequences are still with us today. These Wilsonian character traits, which were reflected as in a mirrored pool by Edith uh, during uh, his incapacity, had manifested themselves in a remarkably parallel way years early during his presidency of Princeton University. At first, they enabled great success in the um, end, they led to abject failure. The failure at the end made his continuous tenure at Princeton impossible. Wilson was a devout man. Although he had a sparkling wit and a commanding personality, he was stern and headstrong to a fault. Son of a Southern Presbyterian minister, but by Preference, he was a Calvinist, and hab preference and habit. Wilson was self-righteous in the extreme, seeking always to justify his actions in terms of moral law and to identify his position with the divine will. He was also a brilliant writer and orator, which is where our story of the intriguing parallels between his careers at Princeton and Versailles begins. First, a bit of background. Wilson's presidency at Princeton began with incomparable success. It ended with a failure, the consequences of which I was to witness firsthand in 1949. After a distinctive academic career and teaching career, Wilson spent 12 years as the most prized professor at Princeton. He was unanimously elected president uh, in 1902. Very popular man, 
Despite his severe Calvinist leanings, Wilson possessed a wry wit. It's very popular among both students and faculty. Uh, he was uh, much in demand as an after-dinner speaker. He loved limericks and often composed them extemporaneously. He was awfully good at it. At a boring faculty dinner during his presidency, for example, uh, while uh, waiting to speak, uh, he composed this one as a number of his academic colleagues droned on and on endlessly. There was a young monk of Siberia whose existence grew drearier and drearier. Till one day with a yell, he burst from his cell and eloped with the mother superior. <laughs> For the first eight years, Wilson had inimitable success. President of Princeton, he was an innovator, supremely confident in his own ability to change the entire culture of the school uh, and bring it into the ranks of Harvard and Yale. And he single-handedly accomplished just that. He instituted a preceptorial tutorial system uh, comparable to that of Oxford and Cambridge to implement this structure he brought into Princeton's campus, 50 highly qualified young men uh, to live among the uh, undergraduates, engage them in academic dialogue both in and out of the classrooms. It was a pattern uh, which would eventually be copied in one form or another by Harvard and Yale. Brought the phrase Harvard, Yale, and Princeton into common parlance uh, for the first time. Faculty love him, trustees loved him, he could do no wrong. Then at the height of his power, height of his popularity, bolstered by his own success, confident that he alone knew what was right for the school and that his perception was divinely preordained, he undertook to introduce quadrangle housing and consequently to undo the entrenched Princeton clubs. He felt that they were interfering with academic achievement. Which brings me to the first of my stories, the story of the student Franz. For uh, through Franz, I was able to witness firsthand the outcome of Wilson's Battle of Princeton. I witnessed it in 1949. I was a product of a public school system, Cleveland, Ohio. So was Franz. Franz's father was a refugee from Nazi Germany eked out a living in the Depression in the Midwest, as a part-time religious school teacher, assistant cantor in the High Holy Days. Franz was not an athlete, but he was a very good student with a pleasing singing voice. He was well-liked by his peers. I was surprised, however, to learn that he had been accepted by Princeton. From what I had heard of Princeton and its exclusive club atmosphere, I thought Franz would be an unlikely fit. Applications to the Ivies then were, as they are now, highly competitive. And particularly for Jewish applicants, there were reportedly restrictions, rigid quotas. The college admissions quotas, however, restrictive as they might be, reportedly paled in connection comparison with those of the notorious Princeton clubs. I wondered how Franz would fare as a distinct ethnic in that extraordinary social environment, a very exclusionary one, or so I was told. So early in my college career, I traveled to Princeton as a member of a college debating team. We were entertained like visiting royalty at one of the finest of those vaunted clubs. Recall the club resembled the plantation Tara in Gone in the Wind, had large white pillars gracing a wide front portico inside. It was as if life had stood still since the Civil War. The club boasted a full complement of African-American waiters, busboys, kitchen help, uh, and so forth. But where did Franz fit into all this antebellum splendor? How had the son of a religious school teacher and part-time cantor in Cleveland, Ohio, survived in this atmosphere? I sought Franz out, and I found him in a so-called cooperative club. Well, those who weren't chosen to be pledged to a club because of their ethnicity, or perhaps since they simply couldn't afford the clubs, had formed their own cooperative club. We do it all ourselves, Franz explained. No waiters, no busboys, no attendants. We have a little help cooking, but by and large, we do that too. We set the tables ourselves. We clean up ourselves. It's a whole different culture here. But if you're a full-time scholarship student like I am, or you're 
not a club legacy, and you're not a star athlete, this makes subsistence here possible. Okay, I said, but how do you find life here, Franz? Is this okay with you? Are you comfortable here? I know that they showcase Albert Einstein front and center all the time with his pipe and his sweater and all their token Jewish genius. Become quite a recognizable personality, but you're no Albert Einstein. Franz paused a long pause, obviously weighing his answer. Then this, Dave, the academics here are exceptional. I'm in a glee club and I've made a great bunch of friends here. But this is the way it really is. Princeton is two different worlds. I'm not really in their world. They're not really in mine. I'm in a cooperative world. We made our own life, and it suits us. But to them, we're really sort of the untouchables here. Uh, they're the Brahmins. There's nothing obvious about it on the surface. It's just there. Now I know that things have changed mightily in 65 years in Princeton, a great, great academic institution. It's far more egalitarian. But that was the picture 65 years ago. Franz was a victim of a battle that Wilson lost. But the loss had dramatic implications for the battles he would lose later. Wilson was aware that the clubs tended to segregate the students, perpetuating social distinctions which Wilson believed were iniquitous. He considered the clubs a distraction from learning, devised a plan to replace them. He would construct quadrangle housing with attached dining halls, each house would be led by its own housemaster and its own group of preceptor tutors. As with the tutorial system itself, Wilson was again following the example of Oxford and Cambridge in his quadrangle proposal. Now, had Princetonians been living in a vacuum, he was in the right. But they weren't living in a vacuum. Far from it. There was a century of entrenched tradition at Princeton. At first, his plan was approved by the trustees who were loathe the cross, the most successful president in the history of Princeton. But it soon turned out that the trustees were influenced by hostile alumni, and they reversed themselves, voted to rescind their hasty approval of the quadrangle plan. There were vested club interests to be reckoned with here. There were opulent legacies. There were families with long club traditions of families who contributed heavily to Old Nassau and who had emotional attachments not only to the orange and black, but their old club ties. There were closely guarded family heirlooms to be passed down from father to son. No self-righteous academic would be allowed to dislodge them. It was a major setback for Wilson, who despite the witticisms felt the sting of their rejection personally. It was not only a betrayal of all that he stood for, it was an outright rejection for unworthy reasons of a principle that he knew to be right. Now, in the foreshadowing of a far more consequential battle over principle only a decade later, Wilson decided to appeal to the alumni over the heads of the trustees. It was a grievous mistake. Another university president, less confident of his proposals, perhaps more Lincoln-esque, less self-righteous in his conviction that his path was the only moral path, might have worked with the trustees and alumni, effect a compromise. But the thought never even occurred to Wilson. He was on the path of righteousness. Those who opposed him were not. There was no deviating. There was no in-between. Compromise of any kind would have been considered deviation from the path of right. Regrettably, Wilson was no Abraham Lincoln negotiating to pass the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. His remarks now became intemperate, disregarding decades of alumni uh, loyalties. He threw all caution to the winds, characterizing his struggle as one between himself as the advocate of democratizing American colleges, and crass alumni who showed no concern for social justice between himself as a moral exemplar 
and those who glorified their social clubs over an institution devoted to fairness and intellectual excellence. His intemperate remarks infuriated the alumni, evoking criticism of Wilson as an errant liar, narrow, bigoted. Wilson lost the battle with the now frenzied alumni, as my friend Franz experienced decades later, it would attest. Didn't get his quadrangle. Nor I, Wilson, would quip. I didn't get the quads, but I got the wrangle. But ironically, Wilson felt that his battle of Princeton could now serve two purposes. It would qualify him to run for state office as, think of it, a rare political candidate. Think of it, a politician of principle. Behold him to no one. And it would give him an out. The chance to leave Princeton on his own volition before being forced to resign. Trustees and alumni were by now so livid over the intemperance of his attack on them, on their integrity, that they might have ridden him out of town on a rail. Well, so much for Princeton. Our story is now fast forward, a decade later, to Paris and Versailles in the critical year 1919. The war is over. The peace committees are meeting in Versailles. It was during this period that the seeds of much that would happen to our nation, as well as Europe and Asia in the 20th century, were sown. For now in 1919, Wilson was no longer seeking to democratize a college. He was on a sacred crusade to make the world safe for democracy. Now how did he get there? Very, very briefly, following his exit from Princeton, he had uh, another meteoric rise like the governor of New Jersey, and then became the very surprised Democratic nominee for president after battling various favorite sons, not nominated until the 46th ballot in a struggle that featured a speech on his behalf by William Jennings Bryan, eventually became one of his secretaries of state. Deadlock, wide open convention, he got there, and then in the three-way race for the presidency, Wilson got lucky. He ran against the incumbent, Republican, William Howard Taft, on the right, and former President Teddy Roosevelt, running now as a bull moose independent candidate on the left. Roosevelt's candidacy, of course, split the Republican vote. As a result, Wilson, running as a moderate in 1912, became the first Democratic president since the Civil War to take office with control of both the House and the Senate. Characteristically, he remarked to a good friend and active supporter, William McCombs, who had had a great deal to do with his campaign. I wish it understood that I owe you nothing. Remember, God ordained that I should be president of the United States. The remark was prescient, for it evidenced one of the traits that would eventually destroy him. An insufficient regard for those who had helped him greatly exaggerated view of what he had done for himself. This, coupled with his adamant refusal to believe that anybody but himself could guide the destiny of mankind at Versailles, led to his destructive implacability, both at Versailles and immediately afterward in the battle over the League and Congress. But the stakes at Versailles were much greater than those at Princeton. The fate of the United States, Europe, and now Asia lay in the balance. Wilson was an idealist, arrived at Versailles at the height of his popularity and power, determined that the United States would be at the forefront of the proceedings. He would take the lead in the crusade to make the world safe for democracy, the battle cry which has sent our troops overseas in the war to end all wars. Others would simply have to follow his lead. The United States had entered the war at a time when the Allied powers were at their lowest ebb. You know, they were exhausted militarily. They were monetarily depleted. Within a year, uh, ally Russia would capitulate at Brest-Litovsk. Lenin would take hold, imposing a new Bolshevik regime. But less than two years later, after American intervention, the entire complexion of World War I had been changed. 
Allied powers would now rise from the depths of despair and would emerge victorious. Young American troops, men such as artillery captain Harry S. Truman, Brigadier General Douglas MacArthur, would fight courageously at the Meuse-Argonne. Chateau Theory, the United States in a few short years, was transformed uh, from a debtor nation to a creditor nation. All of Europe, it seemed, was destitute, now owed us money and great gratitude. It was no wonder that Wilson, as the leader of the savior nation, had entered Paris in triumph amidst the cheering throngs, lined up along the Champs-Élysées. He came armed with a preordained program of 14 points, but with the few, very few foreign policy heavyweights, save his close friend and advisor, Colonel Edward House. He had virtually no one with him with experience in the intricacies of European balance of power negotiations. Just didn't have them. He steadfastly refused to appoint congressional leaders to the Paris Peace Conference. Now that would have involved appointing his arch rival, the brilliant uh, and the powerful chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Henry Cabot Lodge. Lodge was the first ever Harvard doctorate in political science. Wilson despised the other members of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee whom he regarded as intellectual inferiors. Needless to say, there were no Republicans on the delegation in Paris. Wilson ignited moral hopes, arriving in Paris with a stirring 14 points manifesto, asserting groundbreaking concepts such as self-determination. But he was hardly schooled in the age-old machinations of European power politics. As a result, a number of the unrealistic moral goals with which he arrived as a self-appointed leader and savant took on the aura of utopianism when exposed to the actuality of realpolitik in Europe and in Asia. Worse yet, a number of the Wilson concepts, such as self-determination, were ill-defined, spurring hope in many, but ultimately leading to dashed hopes and devastating consequences decades later. The so-called right of self-determination proved controversial. The phrase was opaque. Secretary of State Lansing asked, well, what does he have in mind? Does he mean a race? Does he mean a nation? Does he mean a community? It will raise hopes which can never be realized. It will, I fear, cost thousands of lives. In the end, it's bound to be discredited to be called the dream of an idealist who failed to realize the danger until it was too late. In pragmatic diplomatic terms, the unrealized dreams of self-determination shattered at Versailles had lethal consequences. Many groups of all kinds, sizes, and descriptions considered themselves indeed worthy of self-determination. They submitted petitions if only they could be granted an audience with the great American emancipator, they could convince him of their inherent right to self-determination. Clearly, their age-old ethnic identities, their linguistic distinctiveness, their drive for statehood, their history as victims of colonial occupiers mandated such emancipation by the great man from America. Which brings me to the second of my stories that of the busboy. A young kitchen attendant, busboy at the Ritz Hotel in Paris, together with a coterie of his friends inspired by Wilson's 14 points, prepared a declaration of independence and a proposed constitution meticulously modeled after our own. It's a serious piece of work to take in the little group long hours of careful study, draftsmanship. Headed by the kitchen assistant, they sought an audience with Wilson. Wilson was another Lincoln who would see the rightness of their cause. Surely the great emancipator would grant them self-determination in the form of independence at long last from French Indochina. But alas, Ho Chi Minh and his colleagues from Vietnam were rebuffed in Paris. They were too obscure even to receive an answer. 
A generation of Americans in the 1960s would pay the price for Wilson's indifference or ignorance. They would atone for his failures 40 years later along the deadly Ho Chi Minh Trail in the malaria-infested jungles and swamps of Vietnam. Poet Bob Dylan would sing, Where Have All the Flowers Gone? A chorus in the Broadway musical, Hare would plead, Let the sun shine in, as a generation of flower children became a part of Wilson's Versailles legacy. John F. Kennedy would struggle with it immediately before his death. Lyndon Johnson, obsessed with it, would refuse to run for a second full term and die in bewilderment. Richard Nixon, enveloped in it, following the deadly Kent State massacre, would in a dreamlike sequence confront student protesters under the Lincoln Memorial in the middle of the night, alone, much to the angst of a mortified Secret Service. So much for self-determination. Well, what then of the first of Wilson's 14 points? It seemed harmless enough in its face. It called for open covenants of peace, openly arrived at. It sounded splendid. Unfortunately, it ignored the history and intrigues of European diplomacy and a plethora of past sins that Wilson would now encounter. To cite only one example, on April 26, 1915, in a desperate attempt to induce Italy to join the Allied cause, Britain, France, and Russia had secretly promised Italy a significant part of the Dalmatian coast, Croatia, the peninsula of Istria, and all of Albania in a document that came to be known as the Treaty of London. It was a secret treaty. Now, Italy, one of the five inviting powers at Versailles, now sought to realize the spoils of that treaty. News of the secret treaty came as a shock to Woodrow Wilson. But Italy was a critical player. Its demands could not be ignored, despite the fact that it had already crassly violated the very first of Wilson's cherished 14 points, entering a secret treaty, the Treaty of London. Faced with that fait accompli by one of the inviting powers, Wilson tried in vain to satisfy the Italians' demands on the Balkans at the conference table. He was frustrated, as were the Italians, headed by Prime Minister Vittorio Orlando, a voice of moderation, actually. At one point, Orlando walked out, returned, and finally, to Wilson's dismay, left the conference permanently. His position at home had been severely weakened by a growing Italian nationalist right, which now demanded not only the Dalmatian coast, which had been promised at London, but the little port of Fiume as well. Balkan enigma involving endless ethnicities, broken promises, had become an unsolvable geopolitical jigsaw puzzle leading to the coining of the phrase Balkanization, which has come to mean breaking up into small, hostile political units. Vittorio Orlando, defeated at Versailles, resigned as prime minister. His resignation had severe ramifications, created a power vacuum, which eventually filled by a fringe player. After several hapless interim coalitions uh, had failed, Benito Mussolini, a brazen imperialist and his fascisti, of course, became role models for Adolf Hitler, who idolized Mussolini at first. Well, so much for the first of Wilson's 14 points, wish list, open covenants, openly arrived at. As a self-appointed leader at Versailles, Wilson was ill-equipped to deal with another much more serious dispute, this one with far more ruinous aftermath. Which brings me to the last of my stories, that of a prince, a Japanese prince. His name was Komochi Sianji. In March 1919, Prince Komochi Sianji, the last of the generals, the elders who had quietly pulled the strings in Japan for decades, was now in his 70s. Sianji, who enjoyed the confidence of the Meiji regime, headed the Japanese delegation of the Peace Conference at Versailles. Extraordinary man. Now, he was a childhood playmate of the Meiji Emperor. And he slipped unnoticed into his private apartment in Paris near the Parc Monceau. His arrival was uh, quite con kind of contrast. 
from the fanfare that had heralded the triumphal arrival of Woodrow Wilson. The inscrutable Sionji would maintain a low profile throughout the conference. He would ultimately exit just as quietly as he had entered, but not until he had trumped America's tragic leader and left him in the dust. The Meiji who'd come to power in 1868 had witnessed the havoc wrought by the so-called open door policy. China, they were determined to prevent a repetition of that phenomenon. Japan, the term open door was a euphemism. Point of fact, the open door in China was an open invitation to the European powers to share in the spoils of a decaying and feuding warlords who dominated China. Russia, Britain, France, Germany, among other European powers, had all staked out portions of the Chinese mainland, controlled them uh, through leases wrangled from corrupt Chinese warlords. One of these was the lucrative province of Shantung, which was controlled by Germany. The Germans, likewise, dominated the Carolines, the Marshalls, and the Marianas, all vital Pacific island chains. The Meiji would see to it that no such open door colonization would ever take place in Japan. Instead, under the Meiji Restoration, Japan undertook its own version of our so-called Manifest Destiny. Their policy would eventuate in the famous East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere in the late 30s. The term was also a euphemism for Japanese expansionism. Japan's new rulers embarked on a policy that's been likened to that of a shark which must move through waters to feed. Japan embarked on its own rapid, often vicious expansion to mainland Asia. On August 23rd, 1914, when the war broke out in Europe, Japan declared war on Germany, joining Britain and the Allies ostensibly on the side of the angels. The move was in no way motivated by some lofty ethical principle, such as Wilson's making the world safe for democracy. It was in fact a demonically clever and carefully calculated Asian manifestation of realpolitik. Japan used the declaration of war as an excuse to invade German-controlled Shantung province on the Chinese mainland and German island possessions, the Marianas, the Marshalls, the Carolines. Germany, preoccupied fighting battles on two fronts, was unable to successfully defend Shantung against the Japanese, whose proximity to the province proved an overwhelming strategic advantage. By January 1915, Japan's occupation of Shantung was a fait accompli. Simultaneously, Japan swept into and easily subdued all three German-controlled island chains, a move that would cost us dearly in lives following Pearl Harbor. Obscure islands with names such as Truck, Tinian, Saipan became household words to us during World War II, as did our horrendous casualty lists incurred there. And so, to the tale of the inscrutable Prince Sionji. Prince Sionji's talented team in Versailles, unlike that of Wilson, included two of the most experienced foreign policy hands Japan could muster. Their names were Chinda and Makino. Duo came to be known in Paris as the two Mikados. Nonetheless, they followed orders from the diminutive chess master Sianji, who was hidden away in the Hotel Park Monceau. Subtle, brilliant, experienced chess master Sianji was light years ahead of Wilson's diplomatic horizons, far removed from his idealistic interventionism. Granted, the prince had the chess pieces, but he played them like a grandmaster. Japan had aided Britain in World War I, not only in countering German strength in the Pacific, but by supplying badly needed destroyers in the Mediterranean. That freed up British destroyers and cruisers to patrol the Atlantic and North Sea. The counter submarine traffic, very important. China had come to the party late, joining the Allies only in 1917. You'll recall the war was over. 1918. Their contribution was principally dispatching coolies to dig trenches in France. Japan, although not one of the big four, 
was one of the great powers and five delegates. China was not. It was allowed only two. Japan was admitted to the influential Council of Ten. China was not. The Japanese delegation had been charged by Tokyo with accomplishing three objectives at Versailles. One, to emerge with control of those three North Pacific Island chains. Two, to retain control of Shantung. And three, to succeed in inserting a provision on racial equality into the covenants of the League of Nations. As to the latter, in the eyes of the Japanese, the Americans, the British, and the Australians in particular, had refused to accept the Japanese as legitimate imperial powers in Asia, still refused to accept them as equal. America had cut off further Japanese immigration in 1908. Anti-Asian legislation in California continued to trouble Japanese settlers here. The Japanese were a proud people, and these insults were taken as a direct affront to their national character. The racial equality plank in Sianji's deft hands, however, become a sacrificial pawn to Japan's territorial objectives. When the issue of Shantung finally came to the forefront in Versailles, the Chinese delegation, headed by the eloquent former Columbia debater Wellington Ku, argued that Shantung must not remain in Japanese hands. Ku forcefully detailed Chinese harsh experience under Japan's brutal occupation. Shantung, he argued emotionally, was the cradle of Chinese civilization. It was the home of Confucius. It was the home of Mencius. It was a hole in land for the Chinese. In April 1919, Woodrow Wilson had arrived at triumphal parades. Now he was beset with woes. He'd aged visibly, and the tick in his cheek had grown more pronounced. He may have already suffered a minor stroke, a forerunner of the massive one he was to endure four months later when Edith would become his face and voice. His cherished treaty and whether the dream of a League of Nations in grave jeopardy. One more defection could prove fatal to the conference and to the League. The prince, well aware of Wilson's paranoia in this regard, played to Wilson's weakness and to his own strengths. He dispatched the two Mikados, Makino and Chinda, to call upon Wilson to politely but firmly inform him that the dispute with China must be settled before any treaty with Germany could be signed by Japan. Wilson, the righteous Calvinist moralist, appealed to the Japanese delegate's sense of right, as if he were back at Princeton classroom. Chastising the alumni, he lectured them that nations would have to stop thinking of themselves and more of one another. This was what the League concept was all about. Makino and Chinda listened patiently and politely to Wilson's wish list. And then, as instructed by the chess master, they informed him, just as politely but in no uncertain terms, that if they didn't get Shantung, the former German islands, and the racial equality platform, Japan would not sign the treaty. Wilson panicked. Although Wellington Koo had warned Wilson that leaving Shantung in Japanese hands would devastate the Chinese, that the Japanese as occupiers were butchers, Wilson sought to reassure uh, the Chinese delegation. The League would protect China from any Japanese aggression. But the Chinese now knew that Wilson, in whom they had placed their trust initially, was simply desperate, that his promises were hollow. The League was a paper tiger would protect no one. Wilson had no place in the Machiavellian political arena that Versailles had become. He was no match for the masterful realpolitik of Kamochi Sianji. For the Chinese, this was a life and death struggle. They had experienced Japanese occupation firsthand, but the prince wasn't finished yet. Just as Wilson despaired of losing it all, Sianji made his final move, the coup de grace. Checkmate. He deftly floated a so-called compromise proposal, which a greatly relieved Wilson would now grab at. Namely, 
Japan would cease to insist on the controversial racial equality clause, would agree to withdraw its troops from Shantung at some appropriate future time, provided that Japan would be granted the same economic privileges in Shantung as Germany had uh, before uh, Japan took it over in 1914. Sounds good. This is a tall order. These controls included control of the port, the railways, the mines. In essence, Japan, not China, would control Shantung. As the Council of Four prepared to debate this last compromise proposal, Makino and Shinda gently but firmly reminded them that losing economic control of Shantung was no longer negotiable and would cause them to defect from signing the treaty. Wilson knew that his dream of a League of Nations would be shattered. With a heavy heart, he authorized the council to accept Prince Sianji's compromise. Wilson couldn't sleep. He knew that he had betrayed his own principles. The Chinese, poor Wellington coup, were devastated. They knew full well the Japanese control of the economic vitals of Shantung, even if the military would eventually withdraw, constituted effective control of one of China's richest provinces. They knew that nothing would really change. The China's hopes and dreams of a League of Nations wresting control of mainland China from the hated Japanese was misplaced, that in fact the great American emancipator had feet of clay. It was a ruinous blow to the Chinese. It was a ruinous blow to Chinese self-determination. It led to a fatal aftermath. Wilson's personal security detail in Paris was increased, but far more important in China, on May 3rd, as the news of the sellout at Versailles spread, students at Peking University handing out leaflets planned a rally in Tiananmen Square. They wrote on the walls in blood, demanding the return of the port of Shantung. The rally the next day, May 4th, 1919, now a significant date in Chinese history like our July 4th, drew 3,000 demonstrators and turned violent. The Chinese ambassador to Japan was dragged out of his home, physically beaten. The minister's house was destroyed. The long-term consequences were far more severe, more so than the iconic Woodrow Wilson could ever have dreamed. The coincidence of the failure of the Paris Peace Conference, the coming to power of the Bolsheviks in Russia, and the newly named May 4th movement would ultimately give birth to the rise of the Chinese Communist Party. Only a year and a half later in 1921, Mao Zedong and Chao Enlai will eventually lead the party, dominate China for over half a century, were students at the time. They were full of anger at the Western powers for betraying them, and they now turned active revolutionaries, increasingly looking to Moscow for guidance. The Chinese communists, ultimately led by Mao and Chao, would, of course, evolve into a presence that would come to define American and Soviet foreign policy to this day. It's a presence that would significantly influence each of the four remaining presidents that we will consider in this course, Truman, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon. Although Japan's geopolitical standing in the Pacific had been greatly enhanced, Prince Komochi Sianji returned to his homeland with something far more ominous. A major demarcation line had now been crossed in Japanese-American relations. The Japanese delegation returned convinced that the United States, more than any other power, had now become the real impediment to Japanese power in the Pacific. The seeds of the coming war in the Pacific and Pearl Harbor had now been sown right under the nose of the American president. Well, what then have we seen today? Well, Wilson's implacability, which surfaced in the Battle of Princeton, foreshadowed his failure as a master of diplomacy at Versailles. His supreme self-confidence, reliance on his own domineering personality, power of persuasion, although towers of strength had led to disaster at Versailles, subsequently in Congress. His conviction that his presidency and his mission were righteous, and God-given, unfortunately, impeded his ability to accept the counsel of others more schooled in diplomacy. These unfortunate traits of character were replicated first by Wilson himself and then by his wife, Edith, as his proxy. They tragically inhibited 
his ability to compromise at critical junctures in this battle with Congress. That ultimately doomed U.S. membership in the League. Is this on the final evaluation of this towering figure in American foreign policy? Hardly. What have the tales of the student, the busboy, and the prince really taught us? For one, the tragedy of Wilson was that he was an absolutist, caught in a democratic system, one that exalts flexibility, venerates pragmatism, and is intrinsically messy. Abraham Lincoln, perhaps our greatest president, swallowed hard, worked the system, flattering, cajoling, threatening, even stretching the truth at times. The result was the Emancipation Proclamation, and just before his tragic death, a monumental achievement, the 13th Amendment, the Anti-Slavery Amendment. Wilson's inflexibility destroyed his life stream to make the world safe for democracy. But ironically, the very democracy he sought on a world stage was a system to which he himself proves incapable of adapting when it mattered the most here at home. Historians and diplomats have noted that Wilson's reputation has risen and it has fallen regularly, but that he remains central to an understanding of American foreign policy. Indeed, this is so. Henry Kissinger and George F. Kennan among other notables, have accused Wilson of extraordinary conceit, but they have conceded at the same time that he originated what would become the dominant intellectual school of American foreign policy, and he did. Kissinger, perhaps our quintessential practitioner of realpolitik, horrified when Richard Nixon, of all people, moved Wilson's portrait to a position of prominence in the White House. So we cannot simply dismiss Wilson in a Manichaean uh, fashion. His presidency cannot be simplified and reduced to simple blacks and whites. His legacy was far more complex. For despite his disaster at Versailles and its often tragic legacy since, Wilson in effect catapulted our nation into the forefront of international diplomacy. And his idealism, his cherished, unattainable dream of making the world safe for democracy, which proved a naive, delusional, and ultimately destructive chimera at Versailles, would nonetheless eventually become a cornerstone of US foreign policy, as the free polities of South Korea, Japan, Germany, now much of Eastern Europe, attest. Although he blundered by seizing the leadership role at Versailles, for which he was woefully unprepared. Nevertheless, a threshold had been crossed from which there would be no turning back. The United States would eventually be forced to forego the luxury of isolationism and seize the international leadership role that Wilson had sought so desperately to fulfill. So Wilson was a brilliant but highly flawed leader. His record at Princeton proved to be an ominous foreshadowing of his debacle at Versailles. But he left us with a perplexing legacy, one with unimaginable consequences almost a century later. Consequences we are all living with today, for despite all of his flaws, Wilson would eventually prove to be a transformative leader whose legacy would leave a mark on each of the leaders we'll consider in this course. The precarious balancing act between idealistic interventionism and realpolitik had now been launched on our shores. America, kicking and screaming, had been ushered by Wilson onto the explosive 20th century world scene. Thank you.